Welcome once again to the cesspit known as the internet. Live from the Marriott Library at the University of Utah, this is the Red Line Podcast. I'm your host, Connor Dunstan, and these are my co-hosts... Kyle Holland and... Alex Fielder. Today we've got something special for you folks, actually a bit of a surprise deviation from our planned schedule. Uh, You see, here in good old Salt Lake City, one of our state legislators has introduced a bill to make all public transportation in the state free, Uh, so we thought this would be a great opportunity to talk about free transit. And sorry to our Colombian Twitter followers, but Transmillennial is going to have to wait for a while. Yeah, I still can't believe we have like 114 Twitter followers and half of them don't speak English. I know, right? The algorithm is weird. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, indeed. As usual, we'll talk history, news, and deliver you some of those piping hot takes. Cue the theme music. started okay so to start off with some history free fare public transit has been an idea that has gone back years actually to start off with some more history transit used to be for profit and then we killed it yeah then they made they used to make money yeah they used to make money now they don't but now we got to compete with like subsidized road infrastructure Uh, so subsidized gas and subsidized cars in general yeah so (laughs) anyways in order to compete with those we have Free fab transit. Yeah. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, these began back in the Reagan era, light rail systems. Like the Max and Trax, um, these systems mostly have a free fare downtown to help boost the ridership in those areas. Yeah, and sadly, Portland, uh, Max, they lost their free fare square, is what they called it a few years back because of budget cuts. Mm. But here in Salt Lake, we still have the free fare zone downtown, so that's pretty cool. It's nice. I mean, it's pretty small, but it's in a, like, very central area where our light rail acts like a streetcar, so it's great for just hopping around. Yeah, pretty groovy. Yeah, and uh, this idea of the free, fair public transit has started to grow more in the recent years, with Kansas City becoming the first major city in the U.S. to implement the free, fair operations um, originally in 2019. Yeah, and a bunch of smaller cities have implemented free fare as well, uh, like Logan, Utah, which we're familiar with. Interestingly, they've never actually collected fares, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then Olympia, Washington, Lawrence, Massachusetts, and several other small towns and college towns all have free public transit. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And here in Salt Lake, we have a program called Free Fare for Clean Air. So on days that showcase our notoriously bad air quality. Second in the nation. Oh, Ooh. yeah. <laughs> Go Salt Lake Valley. So yeah. we, lo- we love inversion season. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> UTA, our transit agency, in partnership with the local government, makes fare free in a hope to boost ridership and, you know, fix the smog problem. I mean, it sort of worked. Yeah. Like, they got 8 to 10% ridership growth on fare free days, so, like, it's not bad. I know, it's pretty cool, and it raises awareness for the fact that we have, um, what is it, three light rail lines, one commuter rail line, and a massive bus network. Like, 83 bus lines? Something like that, that yeah. sounds about right to me. Plus our, quote, BRT, unquote. (laughs) Yeah, 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 that's its own deal. (laughs) Uh, What's probably even more interesting in, like, recent history of fare-free transit is uh, LA Metro. You see, there was, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but there was this whole thing that, like, is happening, and it's like a pandemic, and it kind of, like, tanked ridership literally everywhere. Yes, it did. So at the beginning of the pandemic, to try and, like, not do that, LA Metro dropped fares from all services. And as a result of this, their ridership decrease was the least in the nation. Uh, It never dropped below 50% of its pre-pandemic level, and it's rebounded to, like, 80% of pre-COVID levels already, which is better than literally everyone else, including New York. 
That's brilliant. I know. What are we at for a couple of you right now? Um, we're a bit past half. We're like 63% of Somewhere around there. So it okay. varies by service. Like you mentioned bus service. Usage has been recovering faster. Yeah, then tracks are front runner or UVX. Yeah, <laughs> and the S line had a big rebound in December. We'll see if that sticks. I think that's because they had a 15 minute service. That's probably why the S line rebounded is that okay, it actually okay. has like you know acceptable level of service for a rail transit system now. I know, but right? Well, that would explain that. But front runner still not doing too hot. I think the December numbers are about eight or nine thousand weekday boardings Yikes. as compared to like thirty thousand weekday back in the day. Yeah, not not attractive. For, yeah, for a commuter rail. Yeah, not not pretty. Yeah, because eight thousand <laughs> is comparable to back when front runner first opened, or at least the South expansion around yeah. twenty twelve. Yeah, it's not good. But I mean, overall. Situation is improving everywhere, but LA Metro has done like extremely well. I mean, being at 80% of pre-pandemic ridership is just almost unbelievable in the US. Yeah, that's great. Yes. So worldwide, um, like around the world, besides in the US, there's actually a bunch of cities that offer transit for free, especially in France. And like, weirdly, I didn't understand why, but Poland. Uh, and then recently, Luxembourg, which is a country, a small country, albeit, but they now offer free transit throughout their entire country. Wow. Awesome. Yes. Very cool. Uh, and that includes, like, national rail, too. It's not just, like, your tram or your subway or whatever. It's, like... Oh, right, because they have functioning inner city rail. <laughs> yeah. Sigh. Uh, but free fare is becoming a hot topic real fast, especially since we have this massive drop in ridership all over the place. I mean, like, Boston, Portland, Salt Lake, Denver, Austin, Houston, Dallas, even some people in New York who don't understand how New York transit works are like, we should make fare free. <laughs> <laughs> There's this one candidate, I don't remember her name, but she's running for city council in Boston, and her whole campaign thing is like, hey, let's make MBTA free. Dope. Yeah. I know. This As they the say on say. the Twitch, pretty poggers. <laughs> uh, you got to edit that yeah, out. Yeah, cut that, please. So if people all over the nation are thinking about free transit, what are the benefits of it? Well, almost immediately, ridership rises by about 20 to 60 percent, with an almost universal 50 percent growth in the long term. Yeah. Can we do that, please? Because, like, that would get us back up to pre-pandemic levels pretty fast. And those levels were pretty good. Yeah, they weren't bad. They're certainly better than we're doing now. And um, I would very much like to see uh, more people on things than I see currently. That would be nice. I would. That, that would, would be great. That would make me feel better. And then in some places, like, this is a European thing, of course, because they're just better at this than us. Like, in Europe, some cities have seen a 13-fold growth in ridership when they made their transit free. <laughs> Holy hell. Which is, like, a lot, because if, let's say Salt Lake experienced a 13-fold growth in ridership, uh, we would be doing a million three hundred thousand rides a day tomorrow. But we, we couldn't yeah. even come close to handling that. No, we? we, well... We could buy more buses and more LRVs. I would say that Front Runner could handle handle it because you can run 30 minute service on front runner theoretically and they do have enough train sets for it that's good and then tracks could handle a good bit of it but mm -hmm. the bus system would just be completely overwhelmed oh my because yeah. tracks let's see if they run four car train sets at their old frequency which was 12 minutes they used to do 12 minutes yeah they did there were budget cuts uh, right. a few years ago makes sense then they could handle probably 400,000 people a day, maybe. Mm -hmm. So it's not really possible, but like... We don't have the vehicles for it. We don't... It, we would not have the vehicles for it. But if that happened to us, yeah. We'd we, buy more <laughs> vehicles. <laughs> if that happened to, say, like, Seattle or Portland, <laughs> they'd be doing, like, 20 million rides a week. <laughs> so... Oh yeah, which is, you know, what tracks did in 2019. So that that's a lot. Big ridership gains are possible. Yeah. 
And with how underutilized ETA's system is right now, we could absorb a lot of ridership growth very quickly. Well, and that's sort of the thing about it is that you're really actually getting more for your money because since fares are such a like tiny and minuscule part of operating budgets in a lot of transit agencies, you're gaining a lot of ridership and losing very little revenue. Yeah, so your cost per moving a passenger actually goes, decreases. Goes down a lot, yeah. yeah. Even from a taxpayer standpoint, your like your cost per passenger moved is less, mm-hmm. just as a taxpayer. And more taxpayers are getting way more value out of their transit system. Right, because you can just like, hmm, well, my car is broken and I drive all the time, but you know what? That tracks thing can take me pretty close to the darn uh, auto repair shop, so I'm going to take it for once in my life. Oh, wait, this train's kind of nice. Maybe I'm going to take it downtown. Yeah. And even if you drove downtown, you could get all around downtown without driving everywhere else. Paying for four different parking Uh, spots. Absolutely. Or you can park and ride at your nearest tracks park and ride. Yeah. Take the train downtown for free. Exactly. Have a go at it. Save 15, 20 bucks on parking. Mm. Sure. Not to mention gas maintenance, deprecation insurance. uh, (laughs) Lol. Yeah, but transit in America is primarily for underprivileged communities and underserved communities. And you know, if you're living off a social security check, saving two to five dollars a day, not bad. Yeah, everything like, helps. That's so that you have like money for an extra, I don't know, thing of bread and milk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That can mean a lot to some people. Yeah, and you can help out UTA's drivers and operators too. They won't have to deal with. Poor people who can't make fare, they can just focus on driving. Right. It's not as big of an issue anymore. Then you save money on fare collection also, which is a lot more expensive than most people oh, think. Oh, yes. U- uh, UTA is actually spending, I think, $7 million on bringing all of their payment card infrastructure up so to compliance. In some places, it can be up to a third of actual um, revenue. Which is it's just the cost of fare collection. So- it makes no sense. Which explains yeah. why if you get one of UTA's electronic fare cards, you can just save 20 to 40% off the right, fare. Right, because it just saves them a whole bunch of money. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? And then, like we were talking about a minute ago, I think the other benefit makes it easier to try it for the first time. Because transit has this issue where you actually have to pay for it when you're using it instead of paying way more for it later like you do for a car. Mm -hmm. And that just makes the sort of psychological barrier to entry a lot higher. It does. Oh, I can drive my car, quote unquote, for free downtown, or I can pay $250 to take the tracks. I think most people would think of driving as just the cost of gas. Right. Like, driving to downtown and back, that might be five bucks of gas, depending on where you live and depending on how sky-high gas prices are these days. It feels cheaper than taking the tracks. Yeah, because you you paid for the gas earlier, or you're going to pay for it later. Yeah, and you already bought your car. You already pay for maintenance and all that good stuff. You're already paying for insurance. There's just no immediate cost, which is kind of an issue. Like, there's no little ticker on your car that says, like, $5, $6, $7, $8. Oh, my. But when you take transit, there's an immediate cost. you got to pay $2.50 or 2 bucks or however much you're going to pay just to get on the vehicle. And so with free fare, it sort of breaks down that psychological barrier like, oh, maybe I don't drive, question mark. Yeah. And that's powerful because you get someone on the sucker for the first time, they might, like me, just be like, hey, that's pretty cool, and keep going. Yeah, and then they realize, hey, it's not just trains. We've got a massive bus network. Hmm. I can get wherever I want in the northern part of the valley. Maybe I'll give that a try, question mark. (laughs) Yeah, maybe I ought to try this whole front runner train thing next time I want to go down and visit BYU in Provo. Yeah, there's a BYU game on Saturday, and I don't want to deal with parking. Why don't I just go to the Draper front runner station? You know, there's just sort of like these little things of people trying for the first time because it's free that can add up to a lot in the end. Mm -hmm. There are just a couple downsides. Critics really don't think that free public transit gets people out of cars. And I mean, to a certain extent, that's actually true. From the data we have from free fare experiments, like with LA Metro, like other cities have done in the past, It seems as though people who already weren't driving that much are making up for most of the increase in ridership. I say most of, because there is some car grabbage going on, 
But people who drive need more carrots and sticks than uh, just free fare to not drive. Yeah, but it's still an important piece of the puzzle. Another thought with regard to that, I read somewhere that about two-thirds of UTA's fare revenue comes from institutions like colleges and businesses (laughs) and housing developments that pay for their residents or users or whatever to ride UTA's system. And I think it's kind of cool that as a student here at the U, I can just ride tracks and the buses and front runner even wherever I want, whenever I want, and I don't have to worry about it. If I want to invite my friends, I don't have to worry about, oh, that's going to cost two bucks a person. We just go. But not PCSLC Connect. Except PCSLC Connect. We are Connect. forbidden from Route 902. <laughs> <laughs> Sad. Not, oh not really. I don't really need to go to Park City, but, you know. And besides, charging for ski service has always been a good business model. Yeah, that's fair. I would not advocate for making ski buses free. They Dude, should... if you get the Icon Pass, they're free. So when I get my job with Frontrunner at the end of next week, and I get my UTA employee card, which I can use to write for free, my <laughs> university card, which I can use to write for free, and my Icon Pass, which I can use to write for free. Uh, so they pay you $4? For like a standard fare trip and they pay you ten dollars for it yes exactly <laughs> i will be making so much money <laughs> i like uta is just going to be raking it over to me because i just tap all three cards and they're like wait <laughs> no i owe you five dollars now crap oh did I, did I mention fair is free to all u of u sports games with your ticket awesome we mm-hmm. love that That's- and Extra free. And the airport promotion. Oh, yeah, till the end of January. Yep. <laughs> which is, <laughs> which time is should... running out, baby. A mere yeah. week away. <laughs> Although our airport track station is one of the best performing, so, mm-hmm. you know. You know what I think they could do? They could improve the signage in the airport. Yeah, really, because I was in there the other day, and it's kind of out of the way. Yeah. Like, it's really convenient to get to, but it's, like, sort of in a corner, and it's not, like, All I want are some, like, big old signs with, like, a picture of a train and, like, the UCA logo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and what I loved was seeing all these people in line for, like, a lift pickup area <laughs> when there's a track station, like, 200 feet away. No, like, we should we should make that more visible to people who aren't familiar with it, especially because it's free. Like, hey, bro, free or in a month, 250 versus the $30 you're going to pay for a darn cab fare to your yeah. airport. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and your hotel, not to your airport. It, um, you could even, like, take the tracks downtown, and then if you really wanted to, you could catch a lift down there. Well, like, taking tracks downtown, it's not that slow. Like, No. It's fairly equivalent to driving, actually, miraculously. Um, another concern that some people are having, and I think this is why you should sort of decide on a local basis if you should make transit free, there are a couple agencies in the U.S. where fare is actually, like, an important part of mm-hmm. their revenue. Uh, most notably, MTA, which makes up, you know, two-thirds of America's ridership. Fares are, like, actually a legitimately important source of revenue for them because they have just, they have a massive budget in general. Six billion dollars from fares. Holy hell. Billion? B I L L I O N. So billion dollars. I, wow. I think that kind of explains spending two point one billion on Second Avenue when you make six billion a year in just uh, fare. I mean, Second Avenue is still way too expensive, but well, yes. yes. <laughs> but you can but still yes. justify it because it's so good. Second Avenue Subway is very nice section of Subway. I will say that. Mm-hmm. Probably shouldn't have cost that much though. No, but anyway. Not remotely. <laughs> Yeah, so with MTA, you just can't replace that. Like, $6 billion, that's so much money. You, mm-hmm. It's not really possible to easily replace. Yeah, and in these sorts of areas that actually have solid ridership numbers, most of New York. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I can think of six. New York, Boston, Philly, D.C. Uh, this is getting hard already. Chicago. I gotta think of one more. I said six. Seattle? Toronto. Toronto. That's in North America. Awesome. But in these sorts of areas where you already have solid ridership, you don't really need that additional incentive of free fare that reduces that little bit of friction. People in the area are already familiar and comfortable enough with transit to just ride it. Right. Like, you're if you're in one of, like... Let's call them the transit cities, the 10 cities in America where people are actually, like, riding transit on a pretty regular basis. Chances are you've taken it, or at least someone you know has taken it. Mm -hmm. So that takes care of your friction problem. Yes, it does. And then there's this other fear that people have, which is legitimate, and it's that homeless individuals are going to get on the bus or the train and stay there because it's warm and they're not going to freeze to death. 
that's a legitimate issue. Yes, it is. Although I would much rather have a homeless person sitting on my train and sleeping than dying in the street. Yeah, that is yeah. fair. <laughs> and to be even more fair, here in Salt Lake City, we do have a homeless population. It's pretty darn easy to fair dodge on our tracks light rail system. There's no real fare enforcement. Oh. Like you see in metro and subway systems that have like little fair turn styles. We just have the, open air island platforms where you just get on the train, get off. Well, and half the bus riders don't care that much anyway. Mm hmm. I don't know, it feels like the only enforcement we have is the UTA police. Uh, and they just sit and at Central Point and don't the, check. I mean, <laughs> we do have a legit police force, I'll give them that. But, like, on such a massive system, you can't really waste all your police force enforcing fares when they're busy dealing with real problems. Yeah, like shopping carts that people on drugs push into the tracks. Ahem. <laughs> Definitely not a personal experience that I had. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, I want to hear about this later. Oh, okay. It'll be in the Patreon section. All right, all right. <laughs> um, yeah, so for our system and for similar systems that aren't, like, metros with fair gates and a police force that's second only to the city police force. Sure. <clears throat> New York, it's yeah. easier to just give free fare than to try and fix the fare dodging problem. Right, so uh, Portland, Salt Lake, Denver, Dallas, Houston, other similar cities with light rail and bus networks. Make your fares free. Yeah. Do it. Do it. Everywhere do it, except like New York and Philly, I don't know. Because like we said, Boston wants to do it, so... Who am I to say no? Yeah. Boston. Do it, Boston. Do it. Be the free subway. Do it. Be cool. Yeah. Boston. Boston. Pretty cool. <laughs> okay. Boston. Well, thank you, everyone, as always, for listening to our deranged rants about <laughs> transit. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, subscribe on YouTube. Give us a rating on Spotify, because that's a thing now. Oh, nice. Yeah. Mm. Preferably good rating, but we'll take the uh, rest too, I guess. Ratings boost engagement. <laughs> That's true. And there's Patreon too, if you're like insanely generous and want to support three college kids in a library. Yeah. <laughs> um, argue in the comments on YouTube, boost engagement. Yes, we would very much like you to argue with us in the comments. Like, that would be excellent, actually. Yes. I haven't had an argument with someone in several hours. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's a long time. <laughs> yes, it is. Also, uh, if you're coming to us and uh, you saw us, one of our posters around the U of U campus, hello. Hi. Hi. You probably walked past us once. Yes, indeed. Thanks for listening. You're pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah.